Welcome back to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and yours virtually. We're coming to you from garden a to z.org. Um, we're talking about pruning overgrown plants this week. And we're in chapter two now, needled evergreens. That I'm Janet McConovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. We're writers <coughs> and professional gardeners, and we're writing because as professional gardeners, we've learned so much from so many people sharing information with us that we want to keep that, that keep it going. communication going. Um, with us and managing the chat and technical problems is our daughter, Sonia Nicola. She's an excellent gardener in her own right, but she's also a professor at the University of Toronto. She's been virtual teaching and helping her colleagues virtual teach for a couple of years. So if you've got a technical problem, put it into the chat. Yep. Um, our note-taking guide today is a one-day, one-page flowchart um, that you can download on our, on our website. Um, there is a... Uh, uh, a link in the chat if you haven't downloaded it already, or you can go to our webinar guides under the audience materials tab. Find it. Um, so we're moving now into the bottom portion of the flowchart, evergreen or deciduous. When we get down to evergreen, we threw the broadleaf ones up with the deciduous. Broadleaf evergreens, like the Rhodos. boxwoods and the rhododendrons, they're right up there with the deciduous. They're just all handled the same way. But if it's a needled evergreen, we're going to handle it differently. Needled evergreen, Oh, we showed you at the beginning of the first session. PJ Fax, P J F A C S, pine, fir, I'm sorry, pine, juniper, fir, arborvitae, cypress, false cypress, and S spruce. Those guys were down here now. And the first thing we do with them when they're overgrown is cut out what's weak. Whether it's new or old, cut out the weak wood. Weak we've and only, dead. We've only strong stuff that has needles on it. So ugh, ugh, people do this to Mugo pines. First thing we're gonna do is take out all the dead and weak stuff. Just get it out of there. Just get it out and move it all the way back to a, a side branch that has green needles. Take weak wood back to where there's green. There must be green on these. On on all the PJ these. Fax, there must be some green. Yeah, spruce, pine, all of these things that are the needled evergreens. Now it's grown back. Now we can fine tune. So that spot that was weak and so browned out, I'm still thinning back. Can you see the little bit of green in there? Hey, yes, if I can get some light to those guys, they can be side branches again. But if there's no green back there, take the whole branch out. If, if, it's, if there's no green, it's, it's we can't needle. stress this enough on these plants, it won't, they won't come. Right, needle evergreens, take the branch out. And see, it's closing up, that's mm -hmm. fine. And then I just keep pruning some more because it overgrew in the first place. It's going to overgrow again if you don't keep up with it. Then these shrubs are all big shrubs. Yes. I mean, even the even the dwarves get big. Right. This is a dwarf bird's nest spruce. That was a dwarf mugo pine. Um, dwarf bird's nest spruce. We love them for the feathery look, and we cut them back all the time, back to side branches with needles on mm -hmm. them to keep them looking this way. Because although they're dwarf in height, they are enormous this spreaders. Wide. Yeah, they really keep. keep They'll going. double their width. This one got wide in our friend's garden. And, and it kept going that way. Yeah, and she was shearing it because that's what you do, right? You just shear your shrubs back. Well, cutting back to wood that didn't have green on it as it kept extending itself meant that the, you left dead wood that can't grow. And that dead wood built up and built up and built up. I said, oh, nah, okay. I will do this for you because I am a friend. This is ditzy stuff that is um, tedious. I took out all the dead wood. I took out some larger branches. You can see the cuts. I took out a ton of little branches and I left this bird's nest spruce. That is really a little bit beyond the normal. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you're working, just as with the deciduous plants, look for discoloration, canker. Those are sunken spots in the, in the uh, trunk or open spots in the bark or galls, those are deformities. If you see any sign of disease, if you question at all, sterilize your tools and your hands in between your cuts. Yep. So you, um, our friend Carl would keep a, a dilute 10% solution of bleach in a cut down bleach bottle and he'd keep his pruners set in there and he'd dip them in in between. I tried that and it bleaches your pants. pants. Yep. <laughs> so, and um, your gloves. A wipe is probably better. <laughs> 
So what might you be seeing on a, uh, a needled, needled evergreen would be on juniper, this is rust. You're looking at dead branches all over on the inside on the top left. And on the bottom, you're looking at what happens in spring as the rust begins to grow and sporulates and spreads over to its, its summertime host. The crabapple. Um, the branches have cankered. You can see bark discolored and split. Split in. And all of those branches have to be taken off and you gotta clean your pruners because you can, you can transfer that rust fungus to other things. And if they're not healthy to begin with, if they've been abused, sheared for 30 years um, and not fertilized and not watered, especially this is at Niagara Falls at the secret at the Oaks Amphitheater area, they're not going to come back if you cut them back. The, the things that we're telling you are not going to apply to a weak dying, dying plant. plant. Yeah. We can't rescue dying plants by pruning. Right. Um, insect infestation. When you open up the boxwood, um, I can see on my left hand picture by my hand, and we're blowing it up so you can see the webbing. It's a boxwood bite, and they love close, dense shelter. Which, There's lots of dead twiggy stuff inside here. Um, it's one of the reasons to thin things out. Looking inside this U, this is at Cedar Point where we were working with their crew and um, looking to see what to cut back. Can we get this U back? Yes, we can, because it's a U, we can cut it back to bare wood. But if I cut it to here, to bare wood, to get it inside the bed, do you see the difference in the color of the wood outside my hand and inside? That difference in color, that darkness is called sooty mold. It's a fungus that's the fungus, it's not a problem. It's the, the insect that's yeah, the insects that are sucking on the plant are depositing excrement that's causing that mold to grow. When you see sooty mold, when you see dark black branches, and you know the bark should not be black. Sometimes they can even be sticky. Yeah, that means there's an insect infestation of some kind usually a sucking insect in, insect like aphids or scale. And if that's there and you cut all the way back to just a few leaves and you have a whole insect population looking to live on a million leaves, you're probably going to need to follow up afterwards with rinsing the branches off or maybe yeah. using a, a soap, soap solution. Um, so think when you see discoloration or problems. Okay. You're going to shorten all the strong wood to end just above a bud or a side branch, something that has green needles. So on this boxwood hedge, hi, Diane. Boxwood. <laughs> uh, sorry, boxwood. Um, uh, dwarf Bridges. bird's nest spruce hedge. Um, we've cut back what you see on the right, Diane and I. We stopped right where you see there because that's where the wasp's nest was. And we didn't know until it was too late. But we're taking out, can you, can you see bare wood? No because we've cut back to branches with a side green shoot coming out. And that's all we're taking out. We're not shearing and leaving dead wood sticking yep. up. Um, this overgrown Mugo pine, I've cut in half so that you can see inside of it. There were branches where I am right now in the picture and I've taken those out so you can see what the inside looks like. There's green inside. I can cut any of those branches back to where you see right now. So this branch is cut back to just above that side branch. Um, and I could cut back further to the mm -hmm. little stuff on the inside. I can cut to any place where I'm leaving a side branch with green needles and a bud. But if you look at this Mugo pine, if I did cut it back to little, it would be just a few stubs with those small needles inside. And this person said, it's right by my front door. I don't want to leave that. Can you see those little bitty ones? That's all that would be left. And it will grow pretty quickly, but still it's right by your front but door. Not as quickly as, <coughs> people as, want some, to see. as people want to see, yes. Meanwhile, on the other side of the walkway, there's a juniper that's too big. And I look inside the juniper and there are no green buds within the bed line. So all, everything was outside of the walkway. Right, so there's no cutting this juniper back to within the bed unless you say, well, you know, up above, there's one branch that can grow back and it's a cute little tree. And maybe we'll leave this cute little tree there as a topiary instead. But if there's no green within that stain line that you see yeah. there, then it's, there's no chance it's gonna grow back. 
And you don't want the green to be just at the line of the sidewalk either. Remember, we're trying to grow, we're trying to cut back to a foot, let them grow for a foot before they reach your limit mm -hmm. again. So this juniper is too big coming up in the gutter, gotten too wide. We can cut back that branch. We can cut a main branch back to a side branch, or we can cut more branches back to their to tips. Little tips. As they well. will all Again, grow. Little green. But those little green each become a leafy branch. So a lot of potential inside that plant. Mm -hmm. Arborvitae, a lot of potential inside this. I can just clip the top off if I want it to be shorter. But look at the branches further down. I could cut right down there where Steve's pointing and I've got another branch coming. And I will have less wood showing if I cut that far down mm -hmm. rather than if I cut, say, up there. If I cut right there, I'm going to have more wood showing. But if I cut further down, I'll have more green showing. So this arborvitae on the left top, um, the client said, you know, it's, it's too big. I said, OK, I'll cut it back. So I cut it back. And there it is coming back the next spring. And she said, no, no. And I cut back just like you just saw that branch now. I cut the main branches down harder. She said, no, that's still too big. So I cut it further, like you see on the right, and it fluffed out. As long as it's got green, and if you look at the first one on the left, see at the very base of the plant, see the green? It can grow from that far down. So when you look in and you can see the cuts that I've made, they're inside the plant. Mm -hmm. But each cut back to a branch that's got Ooh, needles. Some bud. Yeah. And that little branch right there can it's grow a little to be bit of green right it'll, there. It'll bush out. See the little bits of green where I cut back? Just little nubs of green. And those are branches. Those are not leaves. Those are branches. The leaves on an arborvitae or a juniper are the little pressed scales. There's probably 100 leaves right there. Right. You're looking at a branch coming out there. More than and so those sprouted from where I cut the main central part back. And it can look ugly when you first do it. It will look ugly. There's a lot of brown showing. A lot of times when there's a lot of brown, I just start removing some of the dead wood and some of the thinner wood to just remove the preponderance of brown. Yep. But look at what's going on there. Do you see the little tiny green bud at the top blue arrow? And this one that's on the bottom, the middle blue arrow, it's a bud coming and there's buds coming down there. So, you know, give them time. If you want it to be full, give them time because there's lots of buds even way down on those branches. This is called Arborvitae Got Too Tall, that article. And there's one about taking out whole trunks when your Arborvitae splays open, splayed Arborvitae. I just don't like to see this. We yeah. hate to see this. Someone just sheared this. I thought so. What? Just cleared this globe, sheared this globe arborvitae, and there is no chance, there is zero chance that those branches that you see there are going to grow. There's no green. Yeah. Nothing, nothing doing there. So um, at, at Cedar Point, where they asked us to come and help them with the pruning, they hadn't realized that arborvitaes were going to get so big and didn't know how to cut them back. And we said, well, they're over your walkway, but there's plenty of green in the inside. Cut it back. We can cut them back and we'll cut all the way up. We'll cut from me all the way up to a shorter top. Shorten the top to here, here, and then angle down so that everybody has got, got light. Nobody is shading everybody and hanging over the top of the other ones. Lots of cones developed on there. So that when we cut them back, that was in June. This is in September when we actually did the cutting. Um, now we've shortened them. And now you can see all the cones on the inside that were on the inside of the plant shortened them and, and made them less wide. And you can see the cut there, the white stub showing how big the top was where we mm -hmm. cut it back. On a spruce, it's the same thing. You can cut back only to green, blue, in this case, live growth. So I'm looking inside and I said, we can just make it. We can go to right there. And right there. And those are inside the edge just inside just got to be brave and barb said okay be brave go ahead you can do it so we cut back so there we still have blue and we still have green we have places where it can grow all the way through and now we'll go attack your other one see the background the beast yeah 
and always cut to varied lengths. What you want is room for them to grow for a while before you cut them again. We aim for a foot. We're looking for a foot inside that patio mm -hmm. edge, a foot inside the bed edge. And um, on, a, on the minimum is what you want. You leave about a half inch. If you've got green way down at the ground, at the ground level, leave maybe a half an inch. That's about all that you really need down there. So this juniper that's taken over the parking lot at Tollgate, it's a beautiful juniper. Mm -hmm. And you love that shagginess on a juniper. That's what they're there for, for crying out loud. So we cut it back and kept it shaggy. And that's a skill. It, it is a skill, but people can do it. Sure they can. <clears throat> so that fork is, is in the bed, just inside the edge of the bed. And nobody moved the fork. We just moved the plant back. And we did that by cutting whole branches back to a side branch with some green. And as we reach back in and we cut some of them back two feet and some of them back one foot and some of them back three feet, we yeah. end up with the shagging look continuing. And it will fill out shaky too. <laughs> yeah, and make sure that you peel any sh anything that's gonna shade the growth that you left there, peel that back. Get it away from there. Don't let things shade where you want stuff to grow. And then wait for it to sprout. If it sprouts, See the little bitty sprouts on that juniper? It's the topiary <laughs> juniper. And I'm waiting for you guys. I'm waiting for you guys. And they're going to sprout. And then I can cut back more and let them grow. So on that bird's nest spruce, which kind of looks silly when I first got done with it, but it budded out nicely. And can you see, look at the top left and see the branches that you can see underneath. And look over here. And you see that I'm not seeing as much of that branch. Mm -hmm. The side branches are beginning to fill in and lay over that. And they'll area. start to they'll start to come down and fill this in eventually. Yeah. Arborvitae, globe arborvitae that got too big. We're cut back. It's half cut back. Can you draw the line that shows where it's cut back? Do a curve. You're, you're all over the place, Steve. What? It's right here. No, that's already cut. That's what you said. Yeah. What was already cut back? Right. Um, okay. What I want to do is say, see, I've cut this half of the shrub and this half not. Yeah. There we go. Okay. This half. This and you half can not. see, and I've, it's been kind of an indiscriminate cut. I was just cutting everything back to, as far as I could, as much as green there was inside the plant, I could cut it back about six inches from the edge. So I cut it all back to six inches from the edge and then I thin it out further, cutting some of those branches back deeper so that I can get new growth coming from way deep inside. And I leave it like this. So now I've got it back inside the bed and now you can see there's a bird bath in there. You compare it to the picture on mm -hmm. the top left and you can see that there's a stone edge. And then two years later, it's time to prune again. I like to prune evergreens only every two years if I can help it. Uh, two years later, it's time to prune again. Yep. The uh, plant behind it has begun to hide the sculpture, so you know that the, uh, if I can't see that anymore, then it's time, it's time to, prune. to prune that one. And look at the depth of green that's inside that plant. This is the same plant you're looking at, the same side, how much green has grown in there. It, when you do it this way, it, it allows you to keep doing it this way because it lets more light into the plant. So there's more green on the inside. Yeah. Than when if you constantly share and no light's going through, it's hard. To, yeah. So I've to turned it back it. again two years later. I've reclaimed the edge and now I'm not seeing through it. Now it's, it's a deep green. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard. Um, somebody had been sharing these little bitty arborvitaes the little globe arborvitaes, they've been shearing them so much that all they were were weak stems that they had to tie up with a string. Otherwise it was flapping. flopping all over the place. I said, well, let's see if we can save this. I said, yeah, we can. This is the next spring after I took all the weak and old wood off and left just some sprouts at the bottom. There are some of those branches with sprouts at the bottom. I left right just here. those sprouts <clears throat> and I've got to restart now. One, two, three, four. And yeah, I'm out of control. And that's in an article called Renew Gold Junipers. You'll see those three arborvitaes in the back and the gold junipers in the front. The gold junipers also had been sheared and I thinned them down 
cheered within an inch of their lives almost. And they fluffed back out. And they look so much better, more natural. Yeah. Um, once they're once they've sprouted, you fine tune and, and you're right back up now into the whole same thing you do with the deciduous. You're going to favor the strongest new growth and observe the growth rate. Growth rate is how much does it grow in a year? This juniper is growing about six inches a year. Mm -hmm. And if it's growing six inches a year, I need to cut it back six inches each year. Minimum. And some branches further than six inches. Juniper, we're going to fine tune, cut it back in uh, August one year. We're going to take some branches out in order to get it off of the bed and off of the stairway. Take out a lot of dead wood. So we started with what's on the left. We've, we've thinned and taken dead wood out so it looks like what's on the right. Now the next spring, we're going to let it fill in. It's starting to fill in now. I lost it. And uh, sometime during the summer, it filled in pretty nicely to where it was covering more of the plant of the uh, mm -hmm. wood. So then that year, we started taking out some of the pieces that we'd left. So fine tune after you watch what happens. And growth rate, you can tell by the difference in the color of the bark. That's a twig, that's bark forming there. It's not, it's not a, the needles are the little tiny scales. Just a little one, one. Yeah, so you look at the different color and say, oh, that grew this year, it doesn't have bark yet on it. So you can get yeah. an, a feel for how much yours are growing and that's how much you need to cut back. And some of them grow a lot faster than others. These are green giant arborvitaes. Watch out. Yeah, and uh, one year's growth can be five feet. No problem when they're healthy. So when I cut this green giant arborvitae hedge back, I'm cutting a lot of top off or else they're gonna take off and start shading. That's them. all new. That's all new growth. That's all new growth there next to my camera case on the ground and with my foot to show you. So I know I have to cut back at least that far at the top and not quite as far on the bottom, most plants Grow, that are pyramidal grow faster on the top than on the bottom. But after I've cut, see, I've got the bed back. See that? Now you don't have to brush. You get to drive your car off the road and not hit the, <laughs> not hit the bridge before you were hitting it while you were on the road. And it might not. In fact, if it looks like you haven't done anything, you've done a good job. So if you look at this picture, you have to look at the yellow arrow and the trunk of the tree behind it to see how much has been cut off. It's still a fluffy hedge, but it's been cut way down and way in. And so that's what, that's what we have for you for overgrown plants. Um, it's nice to be able to see the front of your house again, even if it does mean that you have to look at bare wood for a while as things fill in. And uh, it's nicer to let that little arborvitae grow until just when it's time. And all you did was take a year's growth off of it. And nobody can tell. And nobody can tell. Yep. yep. That's yeah. nicer. That's how those cute little plants stay cute and little. Yep. Work. Okay. So we have one minute for probably 100 questions. Let's, let's <laughs> well, see I have been... I've been doing my best to, uh, to answer and refer in the chat. And so... Uh, in my notes, I have what my answers were, and you can clarify where or correct me um, in the chat transcript if I if I gave uh, if I led anyone astray. But there are a few that I wanted to uh, wanted to point out. You are great. Um, You're great. Uh, one is, and I think this is an important one because uh, I know a lot of people are thinking this too. Judith says it would be great if, for those nervous pruners among us, not naming names, there was a list of shrubs that can be cut back to the ground and will come back better. And I said, is this correct that PJ Fax is your list of the exceptions and almost everything else? That's correct. That's right. Okay. That's, that's, that's correct. Right. PJ Fax are the exceptions. Everything else you can cut all the way down. You can yep. do it. Yep. Yep. And, and my, my suggestion as well is that um, you can become less nervous by doing it once and watching how your happy shrub comes roaring back that year. And once you've done that and seen it and trust yourself, um, you'll get less nervous. And if it uh, doesn't okay. come roaring back, maybe it was sick, maybe it was in the wrong place, take a picture and send it to us. And maybe we can tell you why. It's not you, you did not kill it. Most often when you cut back hard, there was another reason the plant died, not from you yep. cutting it back. Yep. 
And also to the uh, to the the uh, pruning for blooms uh, issue too. Remember that there's the short term versus the long term. For as pretty as they are this year, we want to think about want to think about longevity. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, we, we didn't get a whole lot of new needly uh, questions, but a couple more broadleaf questions. Uh, Diane says uh, she has several uh, PJM rotos that are 10, 15 years old. They're getting leggy with a few new smaller with few new smaller branches. And, uh, and they're pale speckled leaves. Should I prune them back, fertilize? If so, when? Paleo. Yeah. You, um, you, you might, uh, it's not a healthy plant. Yes, you can prune it back, but probably you should fertilize. But I would look at it as speckled leaves. Um, the, the chances are that you've got azalea lace bug on it, but you say it's a rhododendron and they don't usually, um, if, it's, if it's not growing well and it's growing leggy, people ask me, can I, prune it back, will it be different? That's the same thing as saying it overgrew once, it's going to overgrow again. It's not going to be better, healthier, deeper green, fuller, unless it, you change some condition that made it leggy in the first place. So it might be leggy because it's got a root problem. It might be leggy because it needs fertilizer. Um, it will grow back if you cut it, cut it back, but it won't grow back better unless you address the other problem. Um, in the Midwest, it would, it would, almost certainly have something to do with nutrient problems. We've, we uh, mulch rhododendrons and azaleas here with cocoa hulls or coffee grounds, something that's acid in reaction and, 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 high, and high nitrogen. Um, and it's, uh, you, you need to find a friend who works mm -hmm. at a coffee place and get all their coffee grounds. Great, great. Um, speaking of, we had a question from, uh, um, Oh dear, I can't find it now. We had a question about whether we can use uh, evergreen clippings um, shredded up as mulch. No reason not to, right? Oh, right. We oh, do yeah. it all the time. We've, <laughs> we've uh, shown that in our trashing the yard, trashing the landscape web webinar. Sometimes we'll just lay the branches down to cover. If, yeah, we're, cutting, yeah. if we're pruning yeah. in the fall, we want to cover something. We might just lay the branches. Yeah, I've got so, a Christmas fir yeah. tree leaning against the back for the birds right now. It's still yeah. quite green, and I'll just I'll, it's just, I'll just green. cut the branches off and lay them down. Great. Um, MJ has a bridal veil spirea that's extremely overgrown. When and how, how far back? They're bigger than six feet tall and wide. Bridal veil spirea can go all the way down. All right? the way to the ground. It's a deciduous shrub. You can cut it all the way down. Yep. And then the next that comes up is the suckering question. Uh, Elizabeth. Will the dwarf spirea sucker if I cut it to the ground? Maria, do you have to dig the suckers? Can you cut them at soil level? Janet, how do you remove suckers? <laughs> um, anything that we can do quickly on suckering? Okay, suckering is it, the technical suckering for a shrub means that it from the sides, like a lilac or a Virginia sweet spire, it, its roots grow out to the side and new canes come up, making the plant wider and wider. Quince does this too. Bridal veil spirea and the dwarf spireas do not sucker. They might lay a branch down into your mm -hmm. mulch and, and grow some roots from a branch sometimes, but they don't sucker. Um, the, so if the plant is a suckering species, it's going to suck. Sucker. It doesn't matter what it, you It doesn't do. matter what you do to it. But if it's a Virginia sweet spire, if it's a bayberry, if it's a quince, it's going to sucker. Um, those that, um, when I say they, they give you bunches and bunches of new growth would be the, like the lilacs and viburnums. When you cut them down, you will get a forest of new shoots coming up. And you'll need to thin those out because you don't want a forest of new shoots. No, because they just what you compete want, with each other. Right, you what you want is a few it. nice branches. So on plants that you cut all the way to the ground, be prepared that when they come up, the fine tuning is going to be thinning them out. But it won't be digging suckers unless it's a suckering plant. All right. Um, and then the uh, Pat's been asking about the diseased branches. Um, and uh, and I, I, I didn't clarify for which kind of disease we're talking about, but um, uh, to a degree, you can you can send your diseased branches to the yard waste uh, site, correct? You, you can. On... We are, it is legal to put diseased and diseased plant material into plastic bags and send them to the landfill, but it's not necessary to do that. Um, with the exception of a couple of viruses, um, the heat of the compost will kill the fungus and the bacteria spores that are there. Um, and 
mo almost all the city yard waste that we know goes it's to hot. farms that are it's incredible how well they compost it. The they keep them turned because they, they need to turn that stuff over as in get rid of it quickly. So they heat it up, they let it heat up, they keep the piles turned, they turn it into compost pretty quickly. So um and and they 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 have they make a good product. So yes, I think it's safe to send those there. And so then Pat's follow-up question about how is city yard waste different from home compost? I mean, if, if you're a great composter and you have a very hot compost at home, then sure. But if your compost is not roaring, um, then you probably don't want to keep those disease branches in your own space. That's right. Yeah. If, you're, if you're just piling your compost up and not turning it, it you need to turn it to yeah. keep it, it needs to be active. That, it needs to be that 140 <laughs> degrees of an active compost. Um, you can bury disease branches 18 inches deep. Yeah. So that there's not the spores can't float up through the soil particles being uh, sitting on the surface or just under the surface. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we are we are definitely running uh, running low on everyone's time, but uh, um, but thank you so much for for every to everyone who's who's uh, here with us, and I hope we see you again. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for being with us for this weekend walkabout on pruning overgrown plants. Next week we're talking about getting the garden ready for spring. 2022 mm -hmm. two version. Yeah. Um, please subscribe. That's what's keeping this website going. We yeah. appreciate your support. We know how much you love working in your yard and your garden. So do we. And we want to all keep doing that the best, wisest way possible. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Take Thank care you. and have a great day. Thank you, Sonia. Take care, everyone. Bye.